So thanks for coming. Um, there's only a few of you, but hopefully some more people might join us throughout. But um, basically, we're going to talk about the future of music a little bit. And uh, maybe because there's not many of us, we can have a, as much of a chat as much as a me just talk to you. And um, I wanted to show you a few concepts and a few little things that uh, tools and development and software, a little bit about the history of music and so on, about, about where technology is taking us. My name's Rob Toulson. I'm a... I'm a musician, music producer, my background's in electronics, so I work in a studio and I've developed software for music and so on, and so we've got some little toys to play. I mean, this is all just a bit of fun, really. Um, music is fun, but it's all got a kind of a core of science and engineering underneath it and technology as well, so by being fun and creative uh, and emotive, let's say, there's it gives us a reason maybe to, to, to delve in and do some, do some programming or work out some mathematical algorithms and, and all of this stuff. So it's about the relationship between science and music, really. So I'm going to talk a little bit about making music in the future. What's what are we going to use tools-wise? How, um, how can we get more people to make music? So at the moment, it's, there's a very specialist group of people that make music, those that are trained probably from an early age. But actually, we want everybody to make music because we think there's a real a real benefit, a real bonus to people's lives making music. Talk a little bit about how we listen to music in the future and now, but also how we, how we maybe buy music or how we share music and all these kind of things that are changing as we get um, new software packages, new types of ways of listening to music. But first I wanted to just talk about a little bit about the science of music because that kind of underpins everything. And I'll talk a little bit about some recording projects, which I've been involved in as well. So what is sound? I mean, that's a big question, actually. But this little video, it's about 20 seconds long, explains quite a lot in a short space of time. When an object vibrates, it pushes the surrounding air molecules into one another, starting a chain reaction of collisions through the air. These collisions travel in waves. When they strike your eardrum, it vibrates. This vibration is converted into electrical signals that your brain recognizes as sound. So, pretty simple. Sound is effectively vibration. If we make something vibrate, it causes the air molecules around it to vibrate, and those air molecules transfer energy and to a point where our ears can pick that up. Now, obviously, Gradually, as that sound trans transmits through the air, it gradually loses energy. So that's why it only travels a certain distance. So if you're too far away, that, that transmission of energy stops at a certain point. If you're closer, obviously, it's, it's more powerful and it's louder. And we can make, you know, but basically that demo showed that we make sound by hitting things. I just go around hitting things. Everything, everything makes a different noise. But essentially, when I hit this, it vibrates for a short amount of time, and that vibration causes those molecules around it to vibrate. So the, this is my demo for hitting things, which is a tuning fork. And um, a tuning fork vibrates in a very specific way. Uh, it's designed to vibrate at a, at a very pure frequency. So when I hit this, it vibrates at a perfect sine wave, in fact. So, um, so these, two, these two bars have got exactly the right weight, the right dimensions, the right material to vibrate at a perfect frequency. And um, there's a really, I think, an interesting example here with, because I've got two tuning forks, <laughs> um, is that we can actually, I can prove to you that those molecules in the air are, are actually transmitting energy, because I can make these two tuning forks interfere with each other through through the air. See, so first thing to note is that when I hit the tuning fork itself, it's not very loud. But when I put the tuning fork in a in a wooden box, it is loud because this box is vibrating as well. So now it's transmitting vibration into the box and the box is able to because it acts a bit like an amplifier. It's able to excite more air molecules. So if I hit these two at the same time, oh, they vibrate together perfectly because they're exactly the same frequency. If I put a little bit of weight on one of these, so I just put a little bit of mass on one of these, 
it's a bit heavier now, so it vibrates slightly slower. So it makes a slightly lower tone. You can only just hear that. But now if I hit both at the same time, they will actually, they won't be harmonious. They will actually interfere with each other. You should be able to hear this. Can you hear that? You can hear those sounds interfering with each other. And if I change, if I change that to somewhere higher up on here, then that mass makes an even bigger difference. And so, essentially, sound is, is physics. It's what we call acoustics. It's about the, the vibration of molecules in air. And there's some really complex um, science that, uh, that surrounds that, especially when we take into account the, the rooms that we use. So the other ways we can make noise and sound... Oops. I've got here. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody has a guess what this is? Okay, I'm going to blow into it. So we can also excite air molecules. Oh, I must have pressed that. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> um, I can also excite air molecules by, uh, by actually causing some turbulence in air through, through wind power. And so this is a, a pipe out of a church organ. And I don't know if you've seen pictures of church organs. They've got these pipes. They've got massive pipes. This is just a small one. But if I blow in it, it causes some turbulent air. And because of the dimensions, it causes another pure sine wave to occur. Now, if I blow it a bit harder, this is quite interesting, hopefully. If I blow it a bit harder, I excite some different vibration frequencies. And so, actually, um, there's a lot of... There's, there's more physics going on in here, in this mouthpiece that's to do with actually how turbulent the air is, determining which frequency this pipe generates. Okay, that's pipes. So we can make sound through hitting things, vibration, things like glockenspiels, uh, xylophones, drums, obviously. And can anyone name anything else that we might use to make sound? Come on, say again voice so that's almost like wind really because that's using vibration to and our mouth becomes a pipe almost that changes shape and that changes the frequency um okay for those that didn't know here we go strings when strings vibrate they make they make they, they do the same thing now much in the same way that our um tuning fork had a box this has got a box on it as well which, which also amplifies the air. And what we've got here is a bunch of different strings, and they're all at slightly different tensions, and they're all slightly different um, thicknesses, and different thicknesses, different tensions, and different lengths. So when I, when I change the length of the string by holding it down at different places, it makes different sounds. So again, the physics of tension, length, um, thickness, and as well, whether it's made of nylon or metal, this, there's equations that actually determine what frequencies these things play at. Okay. Not very in tune. There you go. Um, the reason I did that was because sound is just, that's just a sound. Music is something that's more organized. It's something that's been designed to be played in a pattern or combinations of sound at the same time or sounds that are in a pattern. So music is really just an extension of that theory of sound. Something a number of people, there's lots of, um, there's lots of definitions of what music is, but in some respects I, I like to refer to music as, as organized sound. So what about recording? So I spend a lot of time in a recording studio because I work with musicians taking their sounds, taking their music and putting it onto record, putting it onto CD, making music. So in a recording studio, we need microphones. Microphones are a bit of electronics that effectively act a little bit like our ear. They pick up that vibration and they convert it to some electrical signal. Um, once we've got an electrical signal that represents the sound, uh, oh, I should mention also, we need a room. We need somewhere that's got some acoustic um, properties. So for some 
recordings, we might want a big room like this that has maybe got some reverberation and uh, some echo, or we may want a really small room um, that's quite dry and has no reverberation. It depends what types of music, whether we're recording classical music or rock music, it makes a big difference on to what types of rooms we go into. We also have, usually in a recording studio, some electronic hardware. And this will be things like, often a mixing desk. Well, a mixing desk's job is really to just take all those microphone signals and uh, convert them into a form where they can be recorded onto, in the old days, to tape, but nowadays onto a computer. We've also got things, if you can see in this diagram, we've got some loudspeakers. Uh, we've got various other bits of electronics to change the sound and process the sound. And finally, these days we have recording software. Recording software really is a big part of making music these days. So I was going to just show you some examples. So here is um, here's a recording project I worked on recently, and it's a, it's a choir, a classical choir, singing with some drums and some hand percussion. And this recorded in a big studio, uh, eight female singers, and in a different room was a drummer. And he was, they all had headphones on, and they, c they couldn't see each other, but they could all hear each other. And in another room was a guy playing hand percussion. So I'm just going to hit play on some of this. So, because the drummer was in a different room, I can actually listen to just the drums if I want. So, we recorded the drums on probably seven or eight microphones. Actually, I've got, I can work out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine microphones, all positioned around a drum kit. And that's what they sound like. I think there was, there were... Six singers, six or seven microphones on the singers. So that's just them singing. And also, there's a guy playing hand percussion on his own in another room. So then when we create music, this allows us afterwards to go on to, to try and improve the sound. So I can improve the sound of the drums. I can improve the sound of the voices. I can, I can make them all work together. Um, let's just have that thing again. So, but that was recorded live in a single take, so this actually took place. The people weren't all in the same room, but, but that's, that's the kind of thing we do in a studio. And you can see each of these files here, apologies, the screen resolution's a bit small here, but each of these files represents a different singer, a different, uh, different musician, a uh, different microphone, and so on. Now, I wanted to play you another example from, uh, that's a bit more electronic. So a bit more future facing. And this was recorded predominantly in a studio. Uh, well, the only things that are recorded are the voice and the guitar. The drums, the strings, the, synth the, the keyboards, the piano are all fake instruments. They don't really exist. We had a keyboard. We played all the drums on the keyboard. We played all the violins on the keyboard. And we use uh, samples to make that keyboard sound like those things, but it's got an electronic feel to it. Um, let's see what this sounds like. So, guitars. Lots of synth patches, some piano, some kind of faults, um, strings, drums. And vocals as well. Now, nowadays, because we don't, in, you know, this wouldn't have been possible a number of years ago because we actually had to use real drums, real pianos, real string players. Um, nowadays, we can do something really, really quick, really, really easily. Um, but more than that, it actually creates a whole new way of. Um, of thinking about music and making music. We don't have to make the same sort of music as we made before. And, and, and these things will change more in the future. I just wanted to click on this 
string sample because this is Okay, because I can actually change that now to block and spill. So if I decide I didn't want it to be strings afterwards, I can change it to something else. What else could we change it to? Uh, what was I going to do? Let's go for world. Here we go. Something like a zither. So I can put that back in the mix now. See what it sounds like as a zither. Change the song. But the point is, is that we have this flexibility. We can use modern electronics software to make these, uh, to, 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 to process our music in ways that we, we never could before. And we can do this really quickly. So nowadays, with this type of software, lots of pop up recording studios have started because actually you can make this kind of stuff in a very small room. You don't need lots of equipment. And in a way, part of the future of making music is that anybody can make music. And I'll show you some more apps in a minute that, uh, that show how anyone can make music. Um, so let's go back to that. There was just one thing I wanted to show you while I'm at it, which is um, some sound effects. Because you may have noticed the, the vocals, if I solo the vocals. Cause when you call it doesn't sound like real clear vocals. They've got all these kind of modulation and it's got different sounds going on. We had things like reverb and delay to vocals to make them sound like they're in a different space. Um, and, we, and we do that through mathematical algorithms, through digital signal processing, a mathematical algorithm that takes a sound and changes it to something else. Sometimes subtly, but sometimes quite blatantly. So I was going to show you, just as an example of how easy it is for us to process sounds these days. Um, let's see, I've got a little microphone here. One, One two. two. Hello. Hello. So, so I've, I've got, got a little, little microphone, microphone coming, coming here. here. Hello. A little, little bit, bit of, of delay. delay. Can you hear, Can you hear the, the delay, delay on, on that? that? Not, much. Not much. Okay, okay so, so I'm, I'm going to switch in some, some reverb. reverb. Hello. Hello. Oh, oh, where's, where's that, that gone? gone? Not, Not getting it. <laughs> Okay, here's, here's the reverb. reverb. So, so now it's sound like, like I'm in a cave or, or I'm in a cathedral. Um, but it's, but it's changed, changed, changed the way where it feels like I'm coming from. I can, I also, can also add delay. 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 Hello. 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 So, so we, we can make these sounds. Sound. 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 That these really eerie sounds. I've also got uh Hello Hello This is the voice disguise of Parachute means you can't tell who's talking, but you can still hear what I'm saying. But it, but it makes, makes me sound really, really stupid, stupid, I think. It's got that kind of really slow. Um, we've, we've, got, got, we've got, got alien voices. voices. We've, we've, got, got, we've got all types, types of voices. Darth Vader type of voices. So the point of that really was to say, show very simply how easy it is for us to nowadays use software and tools to, to really change sounds we don't have to make do with with what we've recorded and some of the records these days use uh fairly robotic voices some dance music which i was playing when you came in uses quite robotic voices it's just a new contemporary way of making music so back to back to here i've already mentioned sound effects um i also wanted to show you some effects um using ipads so Nowadays, iPads are really powerful tools. We can make some amazing music with iPads. So I'm just going to flick over this to the iPad. And again, the point of this is to show that actually you don't have to be a trained musician to, I mean, I'm not really a trained musician. I play, I play music, I've performed music, but I'm not a trained musician. But actually, we can start off by doing very random things and then gradually start to create some order and some organized sound. 
And um, actually, if you, we've got a stand outside, and if you look around there, we've got a number of interactive um, uh, music pieces which you can play with. You don't actually have to be a musician to make music these days, which is really fabulous. So this is a, this is a, a drum machine on the iPad. It costs about three pounds to download, so not a lot. It just load up in a second. And this is very similar to the drum machine we've got outside, actually, apart from the one outside has got real drums. You should have a look at it. But I can effectively, this is a kick drum, so I can make a sequence. Let's turn that up a bit. Oh, put some hi hand. Suddenly we've got a drum beat going. No, no, I can do something, I can just be really random. So without knowing, I don't even know what I'm doing, I'm just, you know, making noise. See, these have got some good effects in them as well. I'm just moving this dot around, it's changing the sound. There you go. Making sounds. <laughs> I don't even, you know, like I say, I really don't know much about what I'm doing with that. I just know that, quite simply, after a few goes, we start to learn some techniques that we can start to, like I mentioned earlier, organise the sound. Um, back to here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you was these kind of synthesizers, which are on the iPad. Um, make some really simple music. Um, feel free to come and have a play with some of these later if you like. We'll be, I'll be at the stand and I'll have my iPad if people want to have a play with these kind of apps. Do so. Um, so, oh, let's go back to here. So we've got a number of apps, a number of things that make making music really easy. And I recommend that you get involved in that because it's, it's fun, uh, if nothing else. Here's some robots making music. We nowadays have even robots make music. Th this is a great little video, I think. First person to recognize the tune uh, gets, gets, some, gets, gets, gets my applause, let's say. It's only two minutes long, I'll run it to the end. There we go. So we don't nowadays you don't have we don't have to have great finger technique or be able to play guitar or be able to play violin or piano. You know, this, that was made by uh, the University of Pennsylvania, that video, and, and they programmed a load of robots, and actually they did have people flying those, those copters, but uh, a completely different skill, but still making music. So that's making music now and in the future. Um, but I want to talk about listening to music as well, because um, personally, there's been a change 
uh, in the way we buy music, the way we share music, the way we consume music, and kind of the values that we provide to it. Because I remember um, actually starting off with vinyl. I don't know if, if you guys, you guys all look like you could, you'd recognize some vinyl if you saw it, and a record player. Um, in the old days, we used to go down the shop and buy some vinyl and put it on, take it out the sleeve and put it on the record player. And then we'd have a read of what was on the back and listen to the music and take our time and really enjoy it and really consume it. And in a way, nowadays we use iPods and we use portable devices. Um, and music sometimes becomes a bit of a background thing. And there's, I think that's a bit of a shame. Um, just to trace a little bit what came after vinyl was the cassette. People remember the cassette? Does anyone say what was so great about the cassette? There weren't many things, but can anyone say what was great about the cassette? It was portable. It was the first time that you could actually listen to music on the move, out of the house, while you're at the gym, on the train. That had never been done before. In fact, there were some cars that had record players in them, weren't there, in the 60s? And you, you could, home recording as well, yeah, good point. Because for the first time, you could actually record things from the radio or you could record onto your own tapes. So that really changed things. And although the tape wasn't really classified as a great form of music uh, format, it did actually change it quite a few things. Um, then came the CD, which is, was the first digital form of music. And without going too much into what is digital, it basically allowed a new a new type of, a new way of recording music and producing music that was more reliable, more repeatable, it, it, we could store more data in a smaller uh, environment. So a CD, a CD of that size could store twice as much as a record of this size. Um, and also, I know when CDs came out, they were, they were classed as indestructible, which wasn't really true, but digital itself, um, versus analog, which is all about grooves and vibration, is, uh, is, is a completely different beast. But that was nevertheless a breakthrough. But then they realized, actually, with digital music, we don't, we don't even need the CD. We, once it's digital, we can just stick it straight on the player. And that's when the iPod came in, and that's when the iPod took off. And that's totally revolutionized music, really, how we, how we buy music as well. Now, in some ways, you can say that's pros and cons. In some ways, nowadays, more music is being listened to than ever before because everybody has got an iPod. They've got hundreds of tracks on it and they're always listening wherever they go. So more music is being made than ever before. But actually, conversely, less music is being bought than ever before because actually the value of music has come down quite a lot. When in the old days when people had to save up their month's pocket money to go and buy one record, they then had to listen to that one record for a whole month until they could afford to buy a new one. Um, but in some ways, they got to enjoy that record rather, rather than listening to 30 seconds and then flicking on to the next track and so on. So it's changed a little bit the way we listen to music. Nowadays, we have apps as well. So apps are coming in. One thing, one of the research projects I worked on was to look at how we can take this kind of digital experience, which we, myself and my colleagues, thought had been diminished from going from vinyl, which is a great format. Vinyl has, you know, this is a piece of vinyl. It's got some artwork. It's tangible. It's got all this artwork inside. It's got, it's got all this information about who wrote the songs, what studios they were recorded in. Um, the song lyrics are all elsewhere. I mean, this is, this is a piece of double vinyl. It's got all the song lyrics as well. You know, a beautiful piece of art, really. And um, if you use iTunes, you know, a lot, of this, a lot of this stuff is lost. It's not really there. Um, so we looked at trying to make a new app format. So for this, I'll drop back onto my iPad. We looked at making a new app format, which tried to be digital, but still maintained the kind of qualities of vinyl. And we did this for a band called Francois and the Atlas Mountains. And this is their album. Um, I'm not sure you can see all that. Oh, you can. Cool, this is their album. And... Um, it's bespoke to exactly what they want. We created some animations to add into it. Now, this is their track list. So these are the songs on the album. And I can play one of the songs. And um, while I'm playing the song, 
We've got this little player that a bit like a bit like iTunes, but here we've got the song lyrics that go along with the song. Actually, they're in French and in English. That's the other way around. You can switch on the guitar chords so you can play along on your guitar if you want to. Uh, there's also quite a quite a detailed description of this song, so we can add information, we can add text. We can also look at the look at the band and learn a little bit about the band, see where they, this is all their tour dates. This is a little description of the band, where they came from, um, and the credits, which are quite valuable. These credits which say which musicians played on which songs, which studios were used, which producers who wrote which songs. Really important information actually for musicians because to be able to say I played on that record, they used to be able to do it with vinyl but that, that's not so easy nowadays. Um, of course there are other apps for listening to music. Um, does anyone here use Spotify? You use Spotify? Spotify is great. Um, because with Spotify, I'd still argue it lacks some of these kind of artistic and creative things. It says, search all the world's music, including tracks, albums, you can search anything. Um, someone name us, uh, does anyone want to shout out a song? We'll search for it. Who's your favorite artist at the moment? The Rolling Stones, cool. And let's pick a track. Let's pick um, Gimme Shelter. And hopefully, here we go. Turns up. Gimme Shelter, Rolling Stones. I press play. Great choice. I don't know whether you. Uh Um, <laughs> so there you go. Within seconds, we can um, within seconds we can get a song from the entire world's database. In fact, um, the database of songs in the world is now millions, billions of songs out there in the world, and sometimes it's really hard to know what you want to listen to. Um, in fact, one of the there's a really uh, there's a really interesting example that happens quite a lot these days which is where you might hear a song on the radio or in the pub or in a nightclub and you absolutely don't know what it is but you want to find out. Has anybody used the Shazam app? When you So you've got the Shazam app. Um, Shazam is a phenomenal tool. It's able to, li it's, a, it's essentially a robot. It listens to the music and then it goes off and compares it to all the music in the world and it comes back and says you're listening to this song. So I thought we might try it out. I'm going to stick on randomly a piece of music. Let's pick something from here. Let's put some Radiohead on. So hopefully Shazam will uh, will pick this out. It's always nice to stick a bit of vinyl on. Let's go with that side, and I'm just going to randomly drop it, drop the needle. <laughs> Open Shazam. And hopefully if I hit the button, it listens for a while. It's on the wrong speed, isn't it? <laughs> Let's try that again. So, perfect, found it, go to sleep, I read it. Slow that down a bit, it's just a bit more chill down. <laughs> okay, so, so that's Shazam. So nowadays we have, we have tools, we have digital tools, we have software, we have all these things. And um, just finally to go back to my uh, presentation. So I mentioned, I mentioned our app for with Francois. I mentioned these uh, these apps, and it's sort of, you know, when I when I give these talks, it's like I'm saying 
everybody get involved in music. Uh, and, and there's always a question why. We always get wha asked why. When we're making our, our systems outside, in the, um, which you can see outside, people say, well, what's the use of this? And we say, it's music. It's fun. It's, it's creative. There is, sometimes there isn't a reason. However, there's been some research done in the States that, 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 that actually is quite, quite detailed research that shows that constant pianists have certain parts of their brain are enlarged because they are engaging with music. I mean, music is a very mathematical and a very um, skillful thing to engage with as a performer. But what they also found was that of the, of the biggest companies in, um, in California, 75% of their directors and managing directors were trained musicians. And there really is this connection between affluence and music. And I think, I think for me, personally, I've, I mean, I've written a little list there, but essentially, by being creative, it allows us to explore things and maybe it, it allows our, our, us to, to, to learn how to organize things and to how to, well, how to relax, how to let off steam I've put up there. Um, fundamentally, to be a good performer, a good musician, we have to understand a bit about sound and physics and acoustics. We have to understand a little bit about the mathematical structures of sound. So actually, by engaging with music, we take on these, these skills. Um, it's something we can do on our own. It's something that we can do in groups, bands form, and it's about interaction between two people. So it, it, allow, it, it gives us skills in communication. Um, listening to music can be done in groups, and actually sometimes it's quite powerful how this person from this side of the world might enjoy this type of music, the Rolling Stones. This person from another part of the world will also enjoy the Rolling Stones. Those two people can have a conversation. They've got something connecting them. There's something in common. It's a really powerful tool. And in a way, I, I kind of like to think that the future of music is about bringing it more to the forefront of what we do and encouraging people, even who haven't got grade eight skills on piano or something, to actually get involved. So I'm going to finish. It's not really a quote, but just Einstein, something he said was that if he wasn't a physicist, he'd be a musician. And when he's not being a physicist, he's relaxing in music. And it actually is the thing, one of the things that he, uh, he, he most enjoyed. And I'd like to think if he was here today, he'd be messing about with drum machines and theremin bollards like we've got outside and, uh, and having a lot of fun. So there you go. That's, that's me. That's, uh, that's, that's me. Thanks for listening. And uh, if I'm on Twitter, actually, if you're interested to, to tweet or ask me questions on Twitter. But if there's any questions now, please go for it. Thank you. Do we have any questions on the future of music? I've explained it all. It's as simple as that. <laughs> well, please, <laughs> uh, please come and see our stand outside. We've got some robots, we've got some theremins, we've got some, some uh, non-contact musical instruments that you literally just have to get close to to make sound. We've got uh, instruments that map your body and can, can make allow your body movements to, to create sound. And I'll happily talk you through some apps and things like that as well. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Cheers. <laughs>